So we're uh, short on time, so I'm going to start while the man finds a microphone because I can't stand still. And uh, until then, I'll just fidget in place. What I want to talk about here is a, a class of techniques that you might call cheap learning. This is a cheap pun on deep learning, of course. Uh, and, and what I want to talk about is how, in practice, this big data revolution is having a bigger difference than a lot of us might think. It isn't just enabling these awesome new techniques. It isn't just enabling things like deep learning, which are truly miraculous in terms of, of what they can do, especially if you've been in the field for some time. But it's also enabling a whole new revolution in how many easy problems there are. So um, let's, let's get into this. Uh, One moment, there we go. So, oh, I feel so much better. Uh, I can prance, I can leap, I can so on. Uh, I work for MAPR, in case you didn't notice. Uh, there's the hat, there's the shirt, uh, there's the lanyard, uh, ultimately branded. We don't need the hat right now. Uh, but what I want to talk about here is largely theoretical. It isn't particular to any particular product or any particular software. All the software you see here is available, but that isn't the point. The point is techniques. We have a couple of hashtags, MAPR, MLConf, ATL. Uh, Apache Drill is one of my favorite projects. I work with a lot of projects lately at Apache. Uh, what I want to talk about is the rationale for cheap learning in the first place. Why I want to talk about this at all. And why cheap isn't the same as cheesy, you know, or, or simple-minded. It isn't the same at all. There are some very, very good techniques, and I'm going to describe one core technique with roughly six applications. That's why I'm talking so fast. And then we'll do some conclusions. Now, cheap is better than deep in some cases. For instance, if you have greenfield situations, situations where nobody's really worked on this problem yet, most of the problems are easy. Really, they are. There's a borderline set of problems that are hard, which sit between easy and impossible, those are relatively smaller, typically, than the easy parts. And the impossible parts are, of course, impossible. Now, once the field matures, what does maturation mean? It means people have done the easy stuff. So most of those are done, you know, unless you're really clever and you restate the problem somehow. There's a lot of hard problems to be solved. And, and you see this in real situations speech recognition, visual recognition. These are hard problems. They're probably not impossible. We have a proof example in our own eyes and in our own ears that it can be done by some mechanism. We don't entirely know how to do it now. Those are hard problems. Those take generations to solve. But we're not talking necessarily about mature situations here. This is a new world. If you think about it, the value of data, the, the horizontal axis here is the scale of the computation we're doing, and the value achieved, the net value total, is the vertical axis. Now, we can illustrate this. Here we go. I threw my hat down earlier. Here's a $1 bill, and there's a $20 bill somewhere in here. Uh, it's the first time you've seen people throwing money on stage. Okay, now, if... <laughs> If I were to think about this, which thing should I pick up first? The $1 bill, the $20 bill, the collector edition $1 bill with the special cut in it, or the hat? Clearly the hat comes up first, most value to me. Maybe the 20 comes next. I will pick up the most valuable things first. So given the problem of an analyzing data, which bytes do you analyze first? You analyze the ones you think have highest value first, unless you're an idiot. And probably not that. And so the value goes up very quickly. And because there's long tail in the value, most bytes have very little value if you look across all bytes in the universe. Most are kind of garbage. Maybe someday you'll understand how this particular byte has value. But at least at first, at least with the first techniques you use, it goes up quickly and then becomes very, very flat. Most of the later 
data is the dregs, the stuff that's left over after the really high value stuff was analyzed. But there is still significant value. Because your competition is right up here already, most of the aggregate incremental value that's available is in the dregs, filtering through them, finding what value is in there. But the scale is enormous. The dregs are much, much larger than the original. And so up to now, it's not been feasible to analyze that. Increasing scale by 1,000x changes the game. It makes things much harder, much more expensive, at least if you do it the old way. But it opens up completely new things that we can even work on, completely new ways of looking at problems. And so we have the green field again. And that means it's really, really valuable to become really good at easy answers. These are not stupid answers. These are clever, effective, simple techniques. Now, it's good to be good at the hard stuff, too, because there are hard problems to be solved. But the easy is something that most people never learn, because it's not worth publishing about academically. And most of them don't require advanced learning. So in small data, here's a, an example from security modeling. It's hanging out with friends. And of course, security people always tell good stories. I can't really tell the stories. But imagine you know, you're capturing logs now in the small data world from intrusion detection systems. That the intrusion detection systems have rules or models in them that set off a little alarm when they see something weird. So if you're capturing those, that's good. That's nice. But you inherently only capture the things you already know. Because you built the rules in the intrusion detection system. You do not capture much in the way of new stuff. And you have to hypothesize how it came to be that this thing has occurred. But if we capture all of the switch, the server, the firewall logs, all of that, and we see all these accesses, we can say, whoa, this is odd. This is a strange access. The headers are out of order, or just really subtle characteristics of timing, place, time, distance, all of those sorts of things can come out. And really cheesy techniques can find extremely valuable patterns very quickly. This is an example where categorically changing the amount of data and the type of data, probably by 100x, maybe 1,000x in size, makes the problem a dead cinch, at least the first problems. Suddenly, it makes the number of easy problems enormous because it's green field. It's effectively a new problem. Fraud detection has the same sort of thing. In the small data world, you capture a profile per person. You might create models per segment. If it's really advanced, you might have hundreds of these models. And then you'll evaluate every transaction against the profile and the model that's appropriate for each person. This catches a lot of fraud. Fraudsters, however, adapt. Wherever you stop them, they start trying to work around it. And they try to do things that are more and more clever, more and more subtle. And we've built this thing in the internet, which is a fraudster's paradise. And so they can now steal tens of millions of accounts and they can start doing very small transactions fraudulently that you probably don't read your, I mean, I just bought some, some publication for $8. Am I going to notice if there were two of those in the month or one of those? Probably not. So a lot of that fraud could go even undetected and unreported. But in the big data world, we can keep all of the transactions per user and build per user models. So they know which gas station I buy gas at, which grocery stores I buy at, how much I spend in each place. And so deviations from pattern become grossly apparent. And I've personally saved tens of millions of dollars in the first year where my team with just one and a half people worked for a few weeks. And we were able to get results that 10 people working for three years were unable to get. And the difference was what data we had. We didn't do anything more advanced. I only have one PhD. They had 10. That isn't a fair competition. I didn't do you know, 10 brains worth of work. I didn't have time to do that. We did some of the simple techniques I'm going to describe today. And we kicked their ass. And we got the fraudsters. They went somewhere else other than our customers. That was valuable for us. Now, easy is not stupid. 
you still have to do things plausibly well. You can't just take a ratio. You know, 100% of all one time that I've seen this, it's like this. That doesn't mean it's real. But many people seem to just build these little ratios and things like that and assume that that's a good modeling technique. Other techniques that are similar to that, the ordinary sort of Pearson chi-squared tests and those sorts of things are too simple. They're not designed for this regime. And they come up with very bad results. And as an example, this is a 20-something year old publication. And when we're talking about relatively low probabilities, if we use these approximations, they overestimate significance of something happening uniquely by roughly 200 orders of magnitude. This is what we call, in science, wrong. <laughs> 200 orders of magnitude is a big thing. That's bigger than the number of electrons in the universe. And so that is not a good estimate of surprise. So we have to mask away all the data that that might happen. And that data is all of the rare data, all of the long tail, which is where that scale is. So this says chi-squared ratios, stupid. Newer techniques, much better. Scale does not cure wrong. It just makes easy problems more common. So that's where we're going today. And the one technique that I'm going to talk about here at some length is just the simple thing of finding coincidence. Finding when two things occur together more than you'd expect. Now, an enormous number of problems can reduce down to that. You can talk about A being some condition, fraud, and other would be not fraud. A might be some header in a message. Not A, other would be that header is absent. It might be a word appearing in the first position of a bigram. Other would be all other words appearing in the first position of a bigram. It's really pretty easy. And B is the same sort of thing. It could be a word. It could be an event, an action. It could be anything we can measure and declare to be is or is not. And we can build counts now. How often do A and B occur together? That's K11. How often does B occur without A? K12. A without B, K21. And K22, everything else occurring with everything else, just the, the, the general scale of things. Now, this is very, very well handled by a test that was first derived in the 50s by a Russian mathematician. It's called the G-test now. It didn't used to have a good name. And you can find it at Wikipedia. There's a, there's a good blog that I wrote. I wrote, ooh, I sound so bad. Uh, but it's, it's a simple thing, but it's, it's not well known. It's very closely related to mutual information. It's a very, very simple test to encode. It takes about four lines of R, a few more lines of Java. And it's available in Elasticsearch and in Solar and in Mahout. There's lots of software that embodies it already, a lot of computational linguistics software that does it. It's also available in all kinds of computer languages. So it's a very, very simple thing. And here's what it looks like. If we have, for instance, 13 coincidences out of 1,000 incidences of B, so that means that B occurred, I'm sorry, when B occurred, A occurred about 1% of the time. And when B did not occur, A occurred exactly 1% of the time. This is the who cares condition. They occur about the same. We can't really see anything. We have enough data to definitively say we don't care. It's not interesting. Here's another case. Now here, A and B occur. Remember I said ratios are a problem? Here they occur together 100% of the time out of three instances we've ever seen them. We don't care, really. I mean, it's kind of interesting in a one-third of the world sort of situation. It's just not very interesting because there's so few data that we've observed. Not interesting. This one, on the other hand, A and B have occurred 100% of the time. Seems like the same ratio, but it's a very different situation because there's a lot of other things that have occurred. A and B are relatively rare. And we only ever saw them together. Hmm. If you see two strangers walk into a restaurant next to each other, hmm, yeah, they might be together. They might actually know each other. They might be attached somehow. If, on the other hand, 
You see them walk into a restaurant together 10 times, and you never see them walk anywhere alone, then you go, aha, they are attached. Or if two words always appear in sequence, then they're probably attached. And here, we have lots of data, and so we can attach some, some strong measures on this. And here's what the, this particular g-test describes. These are roughly, these are the square root of the g-test, so roughly in sta standard deviations scale. That was bad. Uh, so here we have one, two, about five. Five standard deviations is enough to designate a subatomic particle, but only if you actually design an experiment that found that particle, not if you design an experiment that could find any of 10 million particles. There's lots and lots of coincidences that we might have in a particular experiment here. So this is not a very good cutoff. It's kind of 1 in 50,000 sort of thing. 14, on the other hand, is 1 in 30 million sort of case. So if we see that and we only have a million possible pairs, yeah, that one's pretty good. And so that's where we would probably draw the, the thing, the, the, the cutoff. Now that's pretty simple. Take the co-occurrence square, compute a score that's super cheap to compute, and pick the biggest ones. So we can find interesting coincidence. What does that give us? That seems too simple, too small, too cheap to be an interesting technique. But in fact, we can do recommendations. We can take a history of people here and things they might interact with. In this case, you probably can't read it, but an apple, a puppy, a pony, and a bicycle. And you can see everybody likes ponies. Who wants a pony? Yeah. Come on, yeah? Yeah, see, everybody wants a pony. Uh, we saw it in the data first, though. Wow. And here we have co-occurrence. You know, puppy and apple, apple and puppy. Pony co-occurs with, well, it co-occurs with everything. We've eliminated the diagonal here because it's how you interpret that is, is debatable. But you can see that that's co-occurrence, but perhaps not with these small counts. We can then reduce it to the pairs of things that co-occur anomalously. These don't have to be from the same set. If we were thinking razor blades, you know, buying the same brand of razor blade co-occurs with later buying that same brand, again, very lot, much. Buying a competitive brand does not co-occur, and so that would not be an indicator of that. Buying a competitive DVD does co-occur with a very similar DVD. Buying the same one does not. You might have different patterns for different things, but then we can just take these rows and stick them into a search index, and kabam, we have a search engine. Cheap, quick, easy. And most importantly, this liberates you to quit looking at algorithms. So this is very simple. You can usually implement it in days. I've seen that bank implemented in days. So I know you can. And so, uh, no, it's not because banks are stupid. It's just because they have process. And that normally degrades everything into months. But this will generally perform within a few percent of the best recommendation algorithms around. But it takes a few percent as long to compute. If you look at, for instance, the Netflix challenge, the first week or so, they had two-thirds of the ultimate, well, within the first month, they had two-thirds or 80% of the ultimate improvement. They needed 10% improvement in order to claim the million-dollar prize, a million dollars. And within a month, they had that 80% of that. And after two more years of the best people and 40,000 entries into the contest, they got another 2%. So this is kind of like the first week, half or more of the improvement. The rest of the work by the world's best people gave us another few percent. On the other hand, spending the time you would have spent on algorithms on finding better data will give you 100% or more improvement. Where should you spend your time? You should do cheap learning and then spend quality time with your data and find out what you should have been doing. I did a recommendation engine for videos, and it was crap because it was looking at clicks. When people clicked on videos, we wanted to use that as a recommendation engine. It was terrible because spammers put really great titles, Iron Man, on Grandmother Gardening. They put really lousy title, blah, 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 on Iron Man because they want to hide it and only tell their friends. And so we were teaching people to click 
on teaching the recommender to teach people to click on the spammy titles. We switched the data to engagement and we got very good results. So here's an example, for instance. This is a recommender from words to videos. Paco de Lucia was a flamenco guitarist who went into jazz. If we search for his name, we know there's nothing by him in this corpus that we could find. But if you use a conventional search, you get Spanish daytime television. This is wrong. If you search using recommendations using this exact technique with no more than LLR and co-occurrence and a little bit of trimming, you get at the top a guy playing Spanish, Spanish classical guitar on a jazz guitar. You see the cutaway? So Paco de Lucia is a jazz guitarist who came from the Spanish classical tradition. And here is somebody playing Spanish classical guitar in a jazz style. That's pretty impressive. Given that there are no correct answers here, there's no music by Paco de in this video collection. This looks terrible. It's a picture of several women dressed in black. But C.U.D. is a flamenco dance troupe, and they're dancing the Bularia. That's kick-ass, too. That's related to where he came from. This is the same classical piece as the top, but now played on a classical guitar. Van Halen here looks like a bad hit but it's 20 seconds from one of these concerts when he played a little bit of classical guitar riff. That's actually kind of cool. And the bottom one here is a kid in a dorm room imitating Paco de Lucia. So we can do some amazing things with cheap learning if we have enough data. How about other domains? I'm going to go quickly here. How about document classification? This is old, but, but the, the principle holds. This is the log likelihood ratio test, the G squared test applied just to sample documents. Give it 20 sample documents, positive and negative. It'll find a query from that that you can apply to other systems. And against the state of the art systems, huge improvements, 10x decrease in error rate. Language classification, 5K of training data, one page of training data, eight languages, zero errors for decent sized text strings. Language, it works. How about genomes? Give it 50 kilobytes of genomic data, and it can identify the species from new data. It's just like language ID. It's exactly the same code. Maybe something more useful to do with money. Well, a common style of fraud is you compromise some retailer. You steal data, and then you commit small frauds. So merchant zero in this simulation is the compromised merchant. During this time period, they're stealing data. During this time, they're exploiting that data. And you can see the general level of fraud detected goes up. This is the end of the simulation. Okay, We, we simulate this by pretty straightforward techniques, but it's very low resolution. No details of the fraud, no details of fraudsters, of the transactions, of the models, nothing. How could it be any good? The reason it's good is because normally security requires model development to be done behind a security boundary that we cannot, as outside collaborators, see the real data. This system took, did not take live data, but it, it takes uh, metaphorically as if we had some system under test, we had failure signatures, it generates fake data that tries to match the failure signatures of real data. It doesn't try to match exactly the real data, but instead it matches the failure signatures. That means the outside collaborator, me in this case, can generate fake data, which matches failure signatures of real data, build a new system, generate new things, and we can see how it works. Now we needed to match like population sizes, things like that, skew, it's pretty easy. Here's how it worked in practice. Here's the simulated results. Merchant Zero popped out of the noise very nicely with this G-test. That's cool. We take all the simulated transaction data, we look at the fraud we detect, and we go back and we say, hey, look at this place. It seems to be very common among fraudsters and not common among non-fraudsters. Fraud, not fraud, that's A and not A. B and not B is every other merchant, or so on. But does this work in the real world? Well, here is a graph of live data, real data, at a bank on the East Coast. There's one up here that turned out, you know, the, they contacted the Secret Service after they got this result. Turns out they were a skimming operation. Checked it out, rat, 
let me say it a little bit louder. These are really truly bad guys there. The system built on this very simple test on cheap learning, on simulated data only, works on live data. So here's a summary. We live right now in a golden age. You just saw six examples of how cheap learning on this newly achieved scale can produce extraordinary results. Uh, hold on before you take the picture, because I got little pictures to go in there. It's, it's much cooler that way. Uh, that scale has lowered the tree. Instead of getting a ladder and, I mean, it used to be we had low-hanging fruit all over the place when data was new and we only had rocks because dirt had not yet been invented. But now we have a choice. We could climb a ladder to try to get to the high fruit, or with big data, we can lower the tree and make a whole bunch of fruit be low-hanging again. And I think we need to do that. We need to get a ladder too, but there's so many things that we can do that are cheap, easy, and extraordinarily effective if we have these extraordinary scale data, high resolution things, if we can just find what's coincidence and what's real surprise and real anomaly. All the code here is available at T. Dunning GitHub. Uh, you can send me email. I can explain how to run it. Uh, it's really pretty easy. Um, and you can contact me by Twitter, by email, just my name with a dot in it at Gmail, or T. Dunning at MapR, or Ted at MapR. I try to make as many aliases that you might guess as possible. And I'd love to talk to people about this. If we have any time for questions, probably not, because I'm kind of over time. I'm so sorry about that. But I'll be available later. And I've got some books on anomaly detection I'll sign at four. And we'd love to have you come talk. Thank you.